think we'll go ahead and get started now. Roundtable workshop on practical applications of water suppression. I'm going to turn it over to David Rice at this time. Welcome, everyone. And yes, I think we have a great topic today, water suppression. And uh, I like the acronym. I'm not sure it's official. I'll ask, I'll ask the panel. So to get started, let's, let me turn everything over to John. Well, thank you, Dave, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. And uh, looks like a very uh, good international uh, audience, as always. This is Ivan Zoom Workshop. Well, Ivan Workshop number 52. Uh, we just celebrated uh, uh, workshop number 50 back uh, last month at uh, one of the uh, evening Ivan hours at uh, uh, Selimar ENC. And, uh, well, we... D Dave, I guess we're just continuing to do at least a, a couple of things right here, so it's uh, uh, ju just as popular as ever. But uh, anyways, I've uh, got a, a great uh, lineup of uh, speakers today, uh, very informative uh, uh, and very important uh, subject material, uh, as always. Uh, MR resources and uh, Q1 instruments are very happy to uh, continue to bring the uh, workshops to you. Uh, MR Resources uh, been around, uh, geez, going into 38 years at this point. Uh, bit, very, very big focus on uh, uh, servicing and, and especially uh, service contracts uh, these days. They've, uh, I'll, I'll dare say, they've really upped their game. Uh, they've always been good at it, but uh, they've added uh, uh, significantly to uh, staff uh, over the last uh, year, uh, significantly to uh, service equipment and uh, uh, their. Uh, really uh, going head to head with uh, uh, brand, brands A and B, if you will. So uh, definitely uh, uh, get in touch, check them out. Uh, very, very good service offerings uh, uh, at uh, very, very realistic and uh, uh, economical prices. Uh, I'll ask uh, Don Bouchard of our sister company, uh, Q1 Instruments, uh, to uh, say a couple of words on uh, Q1, if you would, Don. All right. Thank you very much, John. We invite you to get, to get to know Q1 and Q1 manufacturers magnets and probes and consoles for complete systems from 400 megahertz to 600 megahertz. Our automation uh, upgrade for existing systems is uh, consists of, can consist of the uh, console probe, sample changer and preamplifier for fully automated upgrade to your current older uh, NMR system magnet. And it's excellent performance at an unbeatable price. Turn it back over to you, John. Thank you. Th th thank you, Don. Uh, very good information. Very, very capable uh, product line. Uh, been around for uh, uh, quite a number of years at this point. And uh, please do uh, uh, get in touch with uh, Q1 also. Uh, at, at this point, I would normally uh, turn things over briefly to uh, Krish, but uh, Krish is off in India uh, at this point, uh, preparing for a uh, family wedding. Uh, let us know at the last minute this morning. He was dead tired, going to bed. So with, with that in mind, I'll uh, pass it over to Dave, and uh, Dave can uh, mention some uh, uh, future meetings uh, uh, upcoming, if you would, Dave, and uh, then uh, get okay. things uh, kicked off for us, please. Okay. Uh, so... Uh... There are two upcoming meetings. Um, we have a, our meeting upcoming for June, which I believe is June 29th, um, is on the subject matter of non-uniform sampling, noose. And it has a great, has really a great lineup, uh, including some people that we haven't seen before, but it includes Len Mueller, Chad Renstra, Ben Harding, David Rodniak, and of course, Frank DiLaglio. And uh, so I'm lo really looking forward to that one coming up. And then in July, um, I don't have the date for it in front of me here, but uh, Krish himself is going to give the workshop and the subject will be, uh, guess it, uh, craft. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that one as well. So that's as much as I know about the future. And so with uh, with that information, I think I'll hand things over to our leader. All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the workshop on practical application of water suppression. I, I'm not sure if pause is official or not, but sounds fun. 
uh, Gennady and I uh, will be the uh, leaders of this workshop and uh, we'll see three presentations followed by the discussion. And so next slide, please. The uh, ple please feel free uh, to uh, ask a lot of questions and leave comments uh, in the chat. Uh, the idea is, uh, Krush was supposed to announce it, but Krush is not available, so I'm announcing it. Uh, the idea is that we have presentations first and then we have one uh, discussion that will go as long as needed. Uh, anything that you ask or uh, comment on in the chat, of course, we'll, we'll uh, go through this during the discussion. So just a very brief introduction. Uh, what is water suppression and why, why do we care? Water suppression is a very important part of NMR spectroscopy uh, because water happens to have concentration of uh, hydrogen nuclei of 100 molar, uh, which means that it's many, many orders of magnitude more intense than any signals of interest that we want to observe. And uh, it leads to well-known problems such as dynamic range that we have the formal sensitivity, but uh, if the receiver is saturated by uh, dominant water signal, we, our uh, apparent signal to noise is very bad. Uh, signal clipping when we have ADC overflow, so this is digitizing the, uh, the signal that we detect and um, radiation damping. Uh, which is again with water itself in, induces a uh, radio frequency field uh, just because there is so 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 many of these nuclei. Next slide. Uh, of course, uh, not everyone needs not everyone who uses NMR needs water suppression. If you can use deuterated solvents, that's a great option, of course. But there are many many applications where this is not uh, feasible. Uh, a lot of times uh, we need to analyze uh, formulations or matrices that cannot be tempered in any way. So we need to analyze everything as is, um, uh, or we, for example, in cell NMR or biofluid, something like that. Or sometimes we don't want to uh, have a deuterated uh, solvents because we want to preserve exchangeable protons. And this is a very common uh, theme uh, for peptides and proteins and nucleic acids and uh, many other uh, types of analytes. Uh, reaction monitoring, we don't want isotope effects from deuterated solvents, uh, flow in the MR, uh, and ma ma many other applications, uh, too many to list. Uh, I'm going to repeat this phrase a few times that uh, this workshop is not intended to be as a exhaustive overview of all water suppression techniques. This is just too, too big of a topic, but we will most certainly uh, try to spearhead the discussion and uh, see where it takes us. So uh, this is uh, the, again, a non-exhaustive list of what uh, the, the price that you pay for water suppression. So there is no one perfect water suppression technique. Uh, there is always uh, something uh, that you need to consider when choosing water suppression schemes. Some water suppression schemes are better for one type of samples or questions or systems, and others are better for others. And uh, our uh, panelists will present their cases uh, where you will see uh, how it applies in, in practical uh, situations. Uh, there is uh, a whole gamut of different water suppression schemes. Uh, once again, not this is not by any means uh, intended to be exhaustive. Uh, there are many more. Uh, if you have your favorite water suppression scheme that we want to discuss, please leave a comment in the chat. We will happily discuss that. Just very roughly, trying to talk about what, what the rough types of water suppression uh, schemes. So there are saturating types of so preset, pre noisy preset, purge, wet. There is water gate and water gate could be saturating uh, if it's used without the flip back pulse or it could be non-saturating if it's used with flip back and water gate is very popular for uh, binomar applications. Uh, you can have excitation sculpting. That's also a great tool. Um, jump return. I actually use jump return myself 
ones. Uh, this is a good example of non-saturating uh, water suppression scheme, but you pay a heavy price. Uh, every, everything looks, everything looks, looks pretty bad. And uh, there are also diffusion-based methods, so I just pick one because it sounds fun, uh, dry clean, but there are many other types of water suppression schemes that utilize the difference between the difference in diffusion between your solvent and analyte. And if there is significant difference, you can utilize it to suppress water uh, or solvent while keeping your uh, analyte peaks preserved. And uh, with that, uh, Gennady will introduce our panelists and we'll get underway. Thank you, Misha. So when Misha and I were putting this panel together, we, we really wanted to capture the breadth of the different water suppression techniques that are actually used in practice um, and not just on toy problems um, across multiple disciplines and especially both in academia and industry. And I honestly think we've, we've accomplished that goal with, with this terrific panel that we have. So first I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker who is uh, Emmanuel Hatzakis. So Emmanuel obtained uh, his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in chemistry from the University of Crete in Greece. And after completing his postdoc in the College of Pharmacy at the University of Arizona, he worked as a research associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, followed by uh, a job as an NMR director at the Pennsylvania State University. In August 2016, he joined the Department of Food Science and Technology at the Ohio State University, where he currently holds the title of the Scarlet and Gray Associate Professor. His research interests include applications of liquid and solid state NMR in food science and metabolomics, where he is developing analytical tools, not only to understand the factors that affect food composition and quality, but also to establish agronomic and processing strategies to improve the nutritional value of foods. He also focuses on the development and characterization of value added products from food waste. And he also utilizes a multidisciplinary uh, research approach that combines spectroscopy, metabolomics, gene expression profiles, and microbial analysis to investigate the interaction between food ingredients and gut microbiota. Uh, Emmanuel will be highlighting water suppression as used in complex mixture analysis involving food and metabolomics. So our second speaker, is my former colleague, uh, Caitlin Doolittle, uh, Caitlin Doolittle Catlin. So Caitlin earned her bachelor's in chemistry from Norwich University in 2010 and completed her master's in chemistry through the University of Delaware in 2022 with a research focus on spatially selective NMR for biphasic sample systems. She has 10 years of experience as an NMR spectroscopist, during which time she has worked in support of material science and chemistry at DuPont, where she supported a broad variety of R&D and manufacturing projects as a member of their central analytical services group where she used NMR for quantification and identification of small molecules and polymer materials. Currently, she's supporting biopharmaceutical development and manufacturing at Genentech, where she is a technical development senior scientist in the small molecule impurities NMR group, which is within the pharmaceutical technical development organization. There, her work focuses on performing quantitative NMR at low levels, um, detecting small molecule impurities directly in aqueous protein-containing solutions. Um, today, Caitlin will be highlighting water suppression as used in her line of work, namely QNMR of trace small molecule impurities in biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Our final invited panelist is Mihailo Novakovic. Uh, Mihailo graduated with a bachelor's in physical chemistry from the University of Belgrade in 2016. He then moved to the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, where he completed his PhD degree as a Marie Curie Fellow under the guidance of Professor Lucio Friedman. His PhD research involved the development of NMR methodology with a focus on biomolecular applications involving nucleic acids, proteins, and small molecules. He graduated summa cum laude and received the 2021 PhD Prize in Chemistry awarded by the Dimitris N. Charafas Foundation. Currently, he is doing his postdoc in the group of Professor Frederick Elaine at the ETH Zurich, focusing on NMR characterization of protein RNA interactions and biomolecular condensates. Today, Mihailo will be highlighting water suppression as used in biomolecular systems with an emphasis on preserving fast exchanging proton signals. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our first invited panelist, uh, Emmanuel Hatzakis. Thank you very much. So. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for this nice invitation. Um, in this part of the workshop, we will talk about solvent suppression in, in food science and in NMR-based metabolomics. So uh, in, in those types of, uh, of projects and when you deal with these types of samples, uh, solvent suppression can be more challenging than expected sometimes. So I think it is important to, to be aware of, uh, of the limitations we may face, and I will make some comments um, about it. So uh, to, to understand how we use solvent suppression, especially water suppression, in food science and metabolomics, we first need to know uh, how NMR is used in, in, in those fields. So very briefly, um, in, in food science and metabolomics, NMR is used for structural analysis work, for quantification, either relative or absolute concentrations, uh, and of course, in untargeted analysis, which I will focus a little bit uh, more. So these are the, the three main things uh, we do with NMR. And uh, here is some uh, important information we should know about, uh, about solvent suppression and the samples we use. So very often, the, the samples for those food science and metabolomics applications uh, need solvent suppression. Uh, this happens really often, OK? Uh, the most common solvent we see and we need to suppress is water. Uh, other common solvents include methanol and ethanol. And, and have in mind that um, these solvents, of course, Yes, they may come from some extractions you may did prior to the NMR analysis, but they can be also part of the food sample itself, okay? Uh, many people, in order not to deal with water suppression or to help their solvent suppression, they, they do some solvent removal steps, um, especially for, for untargeted analysis, but in general, this is not always ideal or, or, or a good practical choice, okay? Now, in case you have to do it, because there's no other way to, to run your experiments, you need to, let's say that you decide that, no, I will have to remove the solvent. Um, especially for water, uh, lyophilization, it's what is strongly uh, recommended because this is really important, especially for untargeted analysis, not to, to alter the composition of your uh, sample. Um, another thing which is indirectly or even directly, I would say, related to water suppression is that this food science and uh, biological uh, origin samples, they often contain aggregates, particles, bacteria, and other stuff, uh, which can really uh, cause problems to the homogeneity of the sample. Um, you may face some shimming uh, issues, and of course, this will affect directly the water suppression. The other thing to, 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 which is important to remember is that, uh, especially for metabolomics, for untargeted analysis, um, where we need to analyze many samples, um, we use auto samplers. So this is this automation. Um, so you put, let's say, you know, 100 of samples, and then you start running, and then you go next morning to see your data. Uh, this means that you don't have the chance to really optimize everything manually including water suppression. So don't be surprised if let's say five or even 10% of your samples have water suppression issues. So this is something to keep in mind when you use automation. Um, and of course, I can understand that this depends on the instrumentation, from, on the facility, but a good rule of thumb, it's like five or 10% may happen, okay? Uh, another thing which is very important that can be a good tip. So especially for food analysis, not that much when you work with bioflows like blood or liver or something like, or liver extracts, but when you analyze foods, um, the amount of sample is not an issue, okay? So you can have as many milligrams as you want. Let me put it this way. So if sample amount is not an issue, likely for the compounds of interest, signal to noise, is not an issue too. So uh, you can probably go to a smaller magnet or even use a room temperature probe where you have less radiation damping issues compared to a cry probe. So you can do your work pretty good there, okay? That's another small tip to have in mind. So uh, the first application, as we said, it's to do some type of structural analysis of food ingredients, and this is done uh, generally through 2D NMR. So 2D NMR, 
uh, if you have samples that have, let's say, water inside, two DNMR experiments also require suppression. Um, and this is the case even for experiments that people may think that water will not have a big impact, impact on, the, on the spectra. Let's, for example, DQF cause okay? Although it is true that the double quantum filter removes the singlets from, from the spectrum and makes things easier, uh, it, it's still important to, to have some, some water suppression. Uh, and a good choice there, in my opinion, would be probably uh, a presaturation. I would also like to make a comment about HSQC. And the reason I want to make a comment specifically on HSQC is that it's not only used to, you know, for compound identification and metabolomics, but now uh, we have the tools to do the chemometrics part, the statistical analysis with HSQC. Um, so it's really an experiment which is used a lot. Um, so if you want to use HSQC in those samples and you have water, it's strongly recommended to use a, a gradient version, okay? Because uh, these gradients are supposed to select hydrogens which are attached to carbons. And since water doesn't have those hydrogens, it's really, it's a good choice, okay? So HSQC with water suppression, and again, pre-saturation should be fine in most of the cases. Um, now, uh, I haven't tried it by myself, but uh, the modern super sequences that I have tried different versions, they are now uh, are supposed to have uh, solvent suppression and you can probably get some more information from uh, this paper uh, here. Uh, now, for quantitative analysis, which is another thing we can do uh, with NMR, which is quantification of food ingredients. Um, and again, the question again is, okay, uh, which, which uh, experiment should I, should I use to do uh, quantification? Um, so let, let's see this sugar as an example. And, um, you know, in this complex spectrum, there are additional things that uh, need to be discussed in terms of accuracy of quantification because of the complexity and the overlapping. But if we focus just on the water suppression um, at this point, um, the problem is that you have peaks which are close to, to the water peak, okay? So this beta anom anomeric region, if, if we talk about uh, the sugars, okay? Uh, they are very close to the water peak, so very likely they will be affected by the suppression and you may not have a very good quantitative uh, results. Um, now, in many cases, if you use a presaturation, either the simple one or you know another with composite pulses, and you may reduce the uh, the power level of the pulse or move the carrier a little bit, the uh, the pulse a little bit on the left, you, you should be able to have uh, good results. So uh, presaturation will be my first choice uh, if I had something like that. Um, Others, um, and the reason is that other suppression techniques may, may be not that big quantitative, although they should be checked case by case, okay? So I'm not saying that with other approaches like excitation scuffling or water gate or noisy, you cannot get quantitative results, okay? There are probably some applications that you may be able to, to do some quantifications, but um, it, 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 it's a little bit more complicated. Um, they may, may, may need... Uh, some additional optimization. Um, so the analysis is not that fast and uh, simple anymore, which is one of the big benefits uh, of NMR, at least in metabolomics and in food science. So this should be taken into account. For example, if you use excitation sculpting, yes, you can probably optimize the, uh, the selective pulse and don't affect the neighboring peaks. But then you will have uh, these phase distortions because the uh, homonuclear uh, coupling evolution, which can be corrected by the perfect echo. But again, things can become more complicated. So because of all of those things, and because we have to analyze many samples uh, under identical conditions, especially for a target analysis, uh, my personal opinion, at least, is that we should start with presaturation. Um, something else to have in mind that there are cases, let's say this sugar mixture here. There are cases like uh, ram nose and man nose um, that they are so close to water, which is almost impossible to do a quantification, okay? Even with resaturation. So this is a limitation that you may need to have um, in mind. 
Oops. And then we have uh, untargeted analysis or metabolomics. So the basic concept here is that um, we run many spectra under identical conditions, and then we do some type of spectral comparison using some chemometrics and some statistics. And the dynamic range issue is always an issue in NMR, okay? But I, sometimes it becomes even worse here in metabolomics because um, a minor metabolite um, can be really the important biomarker. So if it's must because of the big signal uh, solvent peak, that's going to be a real problem. Um, historically, um, but there is reason for this, in untargeted analysis in metabolomics, the, 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 the experiment we use is the first increment of noisy with presaturation. Okay, and there are, as I said, reasons for this. Uh, first of all, the water suppression uh, is quite efficient in my opinion, okay? And the experiment, it's relatively easy to set up. There are only a few things that you need to take into account. Uh, it's very gentle, the baseline, this experiment, and this is super important for untargeted analysis to have nice baselines, okay? Um, the sequence is available with and without gradients, um, I'm not sure. So sometimes with the gradient versions, you can see some signal or baseline distortions. Um, I don't know if this is because of some in the currents. It depends also on the probe. Some probes, you can see, you can see these uh, uh, errors more than others. Uh, you can do some optimization with some delays there, but uh, both sequences are very good. Just have in mind that with the gradient version, um, sometimes you can see some phase distortions that you may need to further optimize. Um, it's strongly recommended to follow the phase cycling that the 2D noisy has. And if you want to learn more about this, you can run this nice paper here where they explain all of those things. Um, a comment about post suppression. So even if your suppression was really nice and you don't even see any peak there, uh, you should exclude this area around 4.7 and you know 4.6 to 4.8 or something. You should exclude this from the statistical analysis, okay? Even if your water suppression was perfect. And, and then uh, untargeted analysis is really the case that we use auto sampler. And I already made a comment about that. Uh, it's just to be aware that some samples will not be great in terms of water suppression and you need to reround them. Um, the next slide. So, um, in foods, very often we have more than one solvents, okay, or more than one signals that we need to suppress, even if you have one solvent with more than one signals. Um, an example is beer, okay? Beer has water, which has one signal, and also has ethanol, which has two big signals there. And you can see them here when we run the noisy. The water signal is out, of course, but the two uh, meth ethanol peaks are, are there. Um, so those signals somehow need to be removed uh, in order to have a reasonable analysis. And you could probably physically remove the solvents using a vacuum and alkalization. And this is okay for many people. And it's probably okay with me too. Um, however, remember that in a targeted analysis, we, we really want to minimize the amount of extra variance we add in our system, okay? Because this can distract our uh, statistical analysis. Uh, that's why I personally prefer to, to do a multi-signal, a multi-solvent uh, suppression. In such a case, the first thing that comes to mind is wet, okay? Uh, wet um, uh, combines selective pulses with the gradients, uh, a uh, selective pulse suppresses the signal and then a gradient which follows uh, the phases. Um, so after you do this, by the time you are about to detect your signal, your FID, uh, there is only the magnetization of analytes in the XY plane and you don't have issues with the solvent, ideally. Uh, wet has many applications. Uh, I think that it originally came from people who were doing LC NMR, but it has applications in other fields People who are doing with who are dealing with flowing samples, it works pretty well for all of those applications, and it also has been successfully incorporated in many 2D experiments. Okay, 
uh, although it's a it's a it's a generally good sequence when we tried it to to beer the results were not very good um the water peak was not we were not able to suppress it very well we think that this is because there is an exchange between the ethanol protons and the water protons but regardless the outcome was that we have a very broad water peak regardless how good shimming you're doing the peak was very broad and it couldn't be suppressed what you can do in such a case you can combine wet with noisy and i think you can do this in different ways what we did we had the wet sequence and then we had the noisy block and it worked really well uh, don't forget to especially if you work with something like that that has ethanol don't forget to to apply a selective low power uh, carbon decoupling I think we have here GARP4. Anyway, something like that, because you want to suppress the C13 uh, satellites, OK? If you if you do this decoupling, they will merge with the signal of the C12 proton, and you will have a good result. So you see, uh, the, the result was uh, pretty good, I would say. Uh, a very important topic, at least for me, that I would like to talk is low field NMR, which I'm a big fan, and I want to keep working on this. Um, so low field NMR was used in the past mostly for relaxometry and diffusometry, but now with all of these technological advances, we can do very nice spectroscopic applications. Um, in my opinion, and from what I have seen so far, um, water suppression is still somehow an issue with low field. Um, and, and there are some probably some reasons for this. I will try to, to put my best guess here. So one reason is that, um, gradients is not the default. I'm not saying that there are not uh, low field instruments with gradients. There are, of course, but it's not the default uh, like in a high field. Okay, so in, in these cases, um, you have to go with a type of presaturation. That, that's your only realistic uh, option. Um, also, sometimes the shimming uh, is not, um, there are some issues with the shimming. Um, you can do sample specific shimming, or you can use a general uh, standard sample to shim. Um, but the other thing is that I'm not sure if you can really shim some high order shims. And what you get, it's really a broad peak uh, uh, at the bottom of the spectrum. So anyway, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you here my own experience. Some other people may know better about this, but what we got, um, if we just use suppression in water, we had this. We had to, to combine water suppression with a lyophilization step to get the nice spectra. So this is my experience so far with water suppression with low field. And the last thing that I have for today is that it's something that I found it very interesting, a good idea, and I would, I would like to share it with you. So when we talk about solvent suppression, we generally consider water or another solvent, right? However, in these applications here, uh, they use water suppression techniques, like let's say noisy, uh, to suppress major signals in the spectrum and specifically lipid change from um, the, the, the olive oil triglycerides. Um, so they did this to improve the detection of minor compounds like uh, some terpenes, some uh, sterols, um, some secondary oxidation products that I see here. Um, so yes, this is a different aspect of the dynamic rates problem, but you suppress uh, non-solvent signals. So um, yeah, this is what I had for today. Thank you very much. And I would be happy to, to answer questions. Emmanuel, thank you very much. So as Mishra pointed out earlier, we're, we're, we're going to save the questions till after all three speakers um, finished. But I, I want to, uh, I, I would like to suggest to the audience that all questions for Emmanuel should probably be asked first during the Q&A because he, he has a commitment uh, after this. Um, so thank you very much for that really awesome talk on uh, the use of water suppression in complex mixtures, um, including metabolomics and food science. Really nice use of um, you know pretty much the whole gamut, right? Uh, no, nosy preset and uh, presaturation, presaturation with composite pulses. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Caitlin Doolittle-Catlin uh, from Genentech. 
And uh, Caitlin, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gnabi. Morning, everybody. I'm going to talk about um, using water suppression in biopharmaceuticals for analyzing low level um, analytes and quantitative NMR. So I'm part of the small molecule process impurity group at Genentech. Uh, we support uh, samples all the way from um, you know, development stages uh, through manufacturing. Um, we look at things uh, like cell culture, fluids, um, and different purification steps all the way through to formulated drug substance and product. So we have generally a large volume of samples. Um, and you know, not necessarily a lot of time. Um, and we look at things, you know, directly. We we want to try and minimize, um, you know, alter, altering the samples, et cetera. Um, and you know, we're really kind of looking for a needle in a haystack because we are dealing with aqueous protein solutions, and we're trying to find low-level small molecule impurities like leachables. Um, residual raw materials and things like that. So why is water a problem for us? So like I said, we're often dealing with aqueous samples. These are usually in 90% um, protonated water. Uh, we spike in a little bit of D2O for lock, but that's it. And obviously this causes a number of issues. We don't deal with it. Um, these have been touched on before, but I'll revisit them quickly. So I think we've probably all seen this happen before. Um, receiver overflow, um, you know, truncated spectrum, destroyed spectrum, uh, radiation damping. So yeah, signals, you know, that are broadened, issues with phase and symmetry, and obviously, you know, big problems for quantitative work. Oops. Um, and lastly, dynamic range for small signals. So when you have a huge water signal, it's dictating your minimum detectable signal um, and you are losing your low level analytes in the noise. Okay, so we don't just care about water. Um, it's the first thing we need to take care of. So, you know, here's water signal with radiation damping, huge big signal. We can kind of see some of our buffer components. Once we suppress that, well, and you zoom in, we still have a bunch of these broad protein signals to deal with. So how do we address that? We also use CPMG to um, filter out the protein signals based on T2 relaxation. And we are often getting down to 0.25 micrograms per mil or lower. So again, like I said, needle in a haystack, but I guess if you have a really big magnet, um, it's kind of easy to find those needles. Here's a practical example um, of utilizing this combination of water suppression and CPMG. So here, this is a time series looking at storage conditions and leachables um, uh, yeah, at various storage conditions. So um, you can see here, we're getting down to five micrograms per mil. Um, we actually get lower than that, but this looks like a nice clean peak. And again, I wanna stress that you know this is these, this sample has protein and it has water in it, and we're still able to get down to this level um, after we apply water suppression and CPMG. We have great reproducibility. Um, you know, these are very typical R squared values. Um, you know, one and 0.9998. So this really works well for us. Um, yeah, and it's been it's great. So what water suppression schemes do we use? Um, I'm just going to focus on two primarily today. I'm going to talk about excitation sculpting a little bit and preset. So excitation sculpting, right? You're selectively posting on water, inverting its magnetization, keeping everything else. Um, you're not touching everything else. Then when you apply your refocusing gradient, you dephase your water and refocus everything else. It obliterates the water, you get great water suppression. Pre-SAT, of course, you're applying um, a selective, low power, continuous wave pulse on your water resonance. You're saturating the signal and reducing that, um, that water signal. You do this uh, as part of the relaxation delay prior to your acquisition. So um, excitation sculpting here looks great. Pre-SAT looks a little meh. 
but let's, I don't know, let's not uh, assume that that actually is the whole picture. So some uh, advantages for pre-saturation, it's simple, uh, it's robust, you don't have a lot of spectral artifacts. Um, as uh, Manuel mentioned, you get can get quantitative spectra when you use it. Um, we just saw it doesn't always completely remove every every last little bit of water. Uh, it definitely suppresses exchangeable protons. This is generally not a concern for us as a disclaimer. Um, we're typically not looking for those. And it obviously is also going to suppress signals that are under the water or you know really close on the shoulder, that kind of thing. Excitation sculpting completely obliterates water signal. You can see your labile protein, uh, protons, um, but you do have J modulation issues. And as a result, it's, it's not always reliable for quantitation. All right, so another disclaimer. Um, this is the absolute worst case example for excitation sculpting. This is me calling in a parameter set that had been saved by a former colleague, um, you know, out of the box. I hit go and I have awful, awful line shape distortions. Um, did great with water, but my signals look terrible. Um, you know, just for fun, I went ahead and tried to integrate these propylene glycol signals, which I don't think anybody would do, but you can see, you know, the results are not good. Um, for us. Okay, so I'm going to try and spend a little bit of time optimizing this. I'm playing around with the CPMG. Um, so this is on the bottom. Here's my preset. You know, it looks good. Basically, you know, right out of the box, we've got a 25 mil 0.25 millisecond tau, 200 millisecond CPMG block. Um, so one that I've called in before has a one millisecond tau and 100 millisecond CPMG block. Okay, so I'll change the tau to 0.25 milliseconds. Oh, my peaks are starting to look a lot better, but now suddenly there's protein coming back in. Okay, um, all right, let's try changing our CPMG block. So, you know, up the CPMG block, protein is gone, peak issues becoming more apparent again. Um, play with it a little more, proteins coming back, peaks look better, but not perfect. So all in all, this whole process probably took me about an hour playing with these parameters and running the sample. So, you know, we're very limited on time. We don't have the time to be doing this all um, over and over to try and produce something that would be considered quantitative. And so for us, you know, brute force preset tends to be better. Um, just to further emphasize this, I also called in um, a quick uh, purge CPMG experiment. So we've got similar performance as far as water suppression is concerned, maybe a little bit better. This hump is removed. Um, but you can see there is about a 50% signal reduction. Uh, and this, we can't afford that for these low level impurities we're looking at. And we don't have the time to optimize this. Okay, so going back to preset. There are things you need to consider um, to make sure that you know you have good preset results. So one of these is your offset. Um, very small changes in your offset can have a big impact on how well you are suppressing your water signal. Um, if you're even off by 0.1 ppm, your receiver could be overflowing. Um, your spectrum could be ruined. So you don't want to just assume that your preset your, some preset that you set up for something else, you know, maybe a potentially a different pH is going to inherently work and just queue things up in automation. Um, you always want to check at least one, you know, a couple of scans uh, for your matrix that you're interested in and make sure that it looks good. Um, another issue for preset is shimming. Um, you know, if you have bad shims, if you don't take care of your probe, if you have a contaminated probe, you're going to have a hard time trying to suppress that water with preset. Um, so I had to screw these shims up pretty bad to get this to look like this. But you know, we've seen things like this, people producing spectra like this and saying preset's terrible, it doesn't work. Well, you know, this could be one of the reasons why. So always keep that in mind when you're using preset. Um, another very important thing to think about is your power level and how hard you need to, to hit that water signal. 
um, with your preset pulse. So of course, if you set the water power level too low, you're not going to be effectively suppressing the water signal. So you can see this improved significantly. Um, the suppression of the water signal improved significantly um, with increased power. Um, you know, minimal effect on the cystidine signal right here um, as we go up in power. But you do need to be careful. Uh, I think as, as many of us know, when you're talking about selective pulses, the lower your power, the more selective your pulse is. Um, if you set your preset power too high, trying to just you know completely obliterate the water signal, you run the risk of starting to suppress other signals um, near your water. And you can see that here in the, these um, excitation profiles. So this is higher power and lower power. And you can see the narrowing of your um, bandwidth for your preset. Uh, and this is something really critical to keep in mind when you're trying to plan out how you're going to use preset and what's important to you. You know, Do you really need to get your water down to baseline? Do you really need to get it even below just you know the receiver overflow? I don't know, maybe you need to worry about dynamic range. So maybe you need to get it below your other higher signals, uh, next highest signals, but Again, it, it, you need to think about these things and take that into consideration, especially if you're trying to quantify signals that are near water. Um, lastly, something else to think about for preset versus the length of time um, that you are presetting your signal. So, um, you know, if you don't hit your water signal for long enough, you're not going to fully saturate it and that's gonna cause issues um, as you can see here. Um, and then the other thing I wanna point out is that you know, the Brooker um, preset pulse sequence, the standard ZGPR includes, or it's set up so that you're presetting for your entire relaxation delay. Um, if you don't want to do that, it's very easy to modify your pull sequence so that your relaxation delay is broken into two parts. Um, the first part where, you know, your preset is off, you're purely doing relaxation delay and the second with preset on. So let's say, you know, you need to preset for 30, or you need to have a 30 second relaxation delay or a 15 second relaxation delay, and you don't want the preset on that whole time, you can, you know, have it just relax for the first 10 seconds and then you know preset for the rest. Okay, so in conclusion, well, excitation sculpting, no denying is excellent at removing water signal, definitely better than preset. Um, it does introduce other spectral issues. Um, in our case, I think that these are further amplified with the combination of CPMG potentially um, and when you don't have the time to optimize this for every sample, you know, it's not the way to go. So there are a lot of fancy pulse, uh, water suppression schemas out there that are excellent at removing water. Um, and they can be excellent for other applications. But for us, when we have, you know, a large number of samples, we have people breathing down our necks for results because they've got, you know, a manufacturing lot held up for release. Um, and things like that. We don't have time to sit there and try and optimize these to figure out whether or not our results are quantitative um, and so on. It's definitely important to make sure that your preset, um, preset parameters are set properly. Again, power is really important. Power level, um, your offset is really important. So those are two things that I would highly recommend checking and then you, know, you need to have a system that can shim well. Um, for us, for our application, um, preset is consistently effective enough. So we don't care about having you know our water suppressed down to baseline. We don't care that we see residual water signal. What we care about is having quantitative spectra um, and being able to quantify these low level impurities. So preset is great for us. Um, it's almost always the best option for our applications. Uh, it produces reliably quantitative spectra. Um, and generally, I would say if preset does work for your application, you know, if you're not worried about exchangeables or something that's right next to the water signal, 
you know, or you don't need to get your water signal all the way down to baseline, um, it is a great option. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So thank you very much. Um, look forward to questions afterwards. Caitlin, thank you very much for that awesome presentation. That that really brought me back. So I used to work in Caitlin's group for many years. And <laughs> I, I have to agree with everything she says when 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 there are manufacturing folks breathing down your neck because you know some something's being held up for release. There is no time to optimize these fancy suppression schemes, as tempting as it is to play with them. <laughs> and preset really is the, I mean, it's it's the workhorse for that kind of operation. And it's it's great to to see it highlighted that way. Um, in, in, in all its practical glory. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Thank you. Okay, so our last uh, invited panelist is Mihailo Novakovic. Um, and uh, Mihailo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gennady. Uh, hello, everybody. And I want to thank first Gen Gennady and Misha for in the invitation. And it's my pleasure to be here today. And uh, Today, I'm going to concentrate a little bit on uh, practical application of water suppression uh, from biomolecular NMR perspective. So uh, probably my next, uh, no, uh, I just want to, to, to start this uh, by stressing again how important water suppression has been since decades. So re, uh, you can find first papers appearing even in 70s. And I, I think even in, in 2020, I, I, I found papers still appearing on uh, uh, optimizing water suppression schemes. So it's it's been a lot of research put into this topic. And probably this uh, slide is a bit redundant uh, by now, but I will still repeat it. So uh, water suppression is very important uh, when we want to uh, detect low concentrated so solutes uh, in the presence of 110 milli uh, molar of, of water protons. So we need to suppress this, uh, this uh, high signal of water and also to suppress the water radiation dumping effects. But that's not the topic of, of today's uh, session. So we will not discuss this further. And what are the ideas for water su suppression? We heard uh, almost all of them in the in, in the previous discussion so far, uh, using D2 as a solvent, not always an option. Uh, Pre-saturate water, which is a, a, a great uh, choice in many applications. Uh, then we have uh, dephasing of the water magnetization using uh, RF and field gradient pulses. And then we have basically another uh, way of doing it is, is just by, si by simply not exciting water and exciting everything else. So I call it here semi-selective excitation of the solute. And of course, we have uh, post-processing and di digital uh, with digital filters, but we'll not go uh, deeper today into that. So I will concentrate on these three uh, in the middle, and I'll try to convince you that for biomolecular NMR, it's uh, very important to keep water happily unperturbed, and that this uh, semi-selective excitation of the solute is, is the way to go. Uh, so pre-saturation is historically uh, most commonly used uh, water suppression technique. Super simple. You just irradiate for a long time, it, uh, either like at any time that you wait in your pulse sequence and most commonly during your D1. And uh, basically the water will, from this very broad and big uh, signal, it will, it will uh, if you set, set the parameters correctly, you, you can basically kill almost all the, the, of, of the water protons. However, uh, in biological samples, we, we basically 50% of the signals that, that, that we are observing uh, are exchangeable protons. Uh, so those bound to uh, nitrogen or oxygen. And if you saturate water, like, like I show here, uh, if these protons are saturated through the process of chemical exchange, these uh, hydrogens will be relayed uh, to, uh, to, our, to our solute. So uh, here I show example. So in red, is, uh, it's a structured protein that has actually very slow chemical exchange from amides to water. But still, you can see uh, the detrimental effect of the of the pre pre saturation on the on the on this uh, spectrum of, uh, of of amide protons. You see that that we lose more than fifty percent of, of the signal by applying uh, water pre sat. So uh, I will not come back uh, at uh, pre saturation just just because of of of, of this fact that I mean we we sometimes use pre saturation, but it's not the the method of choice. 
Uh, the second uh, technique that we can use is, uh, or the second idea that we can use to design uh, water suppression scheme is basically uh, we can try to dephase water magnetization uh, after the the excitation pulse. And the idea came really from from this uh, selective echo, uh, or, or, or sorry, uh, spin, spin echo experiment with two gradients where first gradient will uh, dephase everything and then 180 degree pulse will reverse the effect of this uh, gradient pulse and then the application of, of the second gradient of the same sign will basically refocus uh, everything and then you, you would have a perfect echo of everything. But for the water suppression application, people figured out that you can put these two selective 90 degree pulses uh, flanking this hard 180 and uh, those will be, uh, since you're on resonance with water, those will be selective on water and basically water uh, after this pulse sandwich water will experience zero net rotation and then uh, this gradient uh, the second gradient will just uh, further kill the, the water magnetization so basically we can use this experiment to to dephase water uh, post the uh, uh, after the ex excitation pulse here and this is basically a foundation of many 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 experiments uh, that include wat Watergate and excitation sculpting techniques that were also discussed in the previous two talks. But I will also try to, to explain them a bit more in details now. So you, you can see here, this is the basic sequence of Watergate and the basic sequence of excitation sculpting. Again, you use uh, selective pulses. So either in Watergate, uh, two selective 90s or in excitation sculpting, it's uh, 180 degree pulse. Uh, and you utilize this uh, soft hard soft pulse sandwich to achieve uh, the solute excitation by avoiding or sorry by killing uh, water signal and uh, the, there there has been new uh, new flavors emerging uh, after this initial watergate and excitation sculpting experiments which was uh, a, a watergate 3919 experiment that now utilizes a uh, dante style binomial se selective 180 degree pulse using this uh, pulse tray that actually gives uh, 180 degree um, uh, re re refocusing to everything except uh, what, is, what, what is directly on resonance, which is in this case water. So we always stand on resonance. And even though in Watergate 39119, you don't you don't need to calibrate selective pulses. The downside of, of, of this experiment is the periodicity of excitation profile. Uh, so you can see here that uh, uh, based on this uh, tau delay that we set up between these passes, we can achieve uh, broader or, or, or narrower ex excitation, but it will always be periodic uh, with the multiple uh, maximum and minimum uh, yeah, of, 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 of the excited signal. So we need to be careful about uh, optimizing this, and I want, to, I want you to keep that in mind. Uh, then... Uh, I, I want to discuss the, the third class. It's a select semi-selective excitation of the solute. Uh, so these experiments will try not to kill water, but actually try to uh, to preserve it and keep it on on plus Z. The simplest experiment and very very old, I think in uh, in seven in 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 eighty two, uh, jump return uses just two pulses with uh, opposite phase. If water is on resonance, it will not evolve after the first uh, excitation. So basically, the second uh, pi half uh, will act as a storage pulse, and the water will be uh, returned back to Z. And we can optimize this tau to excite uh, what we want, basically. So we can optimize this tau to give the 90 degree excitation to uh, to the area that we want to concentrate of, of, of our bi bi biomolecule. And, uh, uh, because of this uh, sign uh, sign profile that that that, that this uh, experiment provide excitation profile that this experiment provides, we would get uh, kind of uh, uh, phase throughout the the spectrum. So uh, it's you 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 will see it in next slide. Uh, for example, um, upfield if upfield excited uh, part of the spectrum is uh, is is positive, the down the downfield would be negative because sine is an old function. So I usually don't prefer using this experiment. And then we have this excitation sculpting with water uh, with water flip pulse and water gate with with water flip pulse. And I want to point attention that 
that we are just uh, introducing additional 90 degree selective uh, pulse on water before uh, the start of, of, of the experiment. So that's the whole change, the whole change between, uh, from, from what I described in the previous slide. And what's, what this achieves is that selective pulse will, will flip water down, but then the hard pulse will flip it back because it's of opposite phase by, but also it will excite everything else. So in this manner, Throughout the whole experiment, we don't uh, we don't we don't excite water, but we try to keep it all the time at, uh, on plus Z. And why why is this important? I I think you will appreciate from from these slides. Um, uh, so this is a, a protein a nucleocapsid from SARS-CoV-2. It contains many. Uh, unstructured parts that exchange super fast with water. And even though I, here I applied like uh, five different experiments, they all provide pretty good uh, water suppression, but we need to concentrate also on what's happening with the protein signal. So if you look at these uh, amide NHs, uh, you can see that uh, uh, there are differences in, in the signal uh, going from one to, to, to another sequence. And now I, I can basically put a caption and you can see that all these experiments where signal is maximum uh, are the ones that try to preserve water on Z, where if we try to kill water here with excitation sculpting on or, or regular water gate, you see that these signals are the smallest of, of all. Then we can concentrate also on um, uh, these uh, H alpha protons. You see they're, they're nicely preserved uh, in uh, excitation sculpting, but uh, a, a bit worse in, in jump return and, and water gate. And if we look at CHs, it's mostly good, uh, but of course, in jump return, what 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 I explained is that you have this sign excitation profile, so some peaks will be positive and some negative. So this is why we we generally try to avoid this. And now I'm going to shift gears and show you some examples with RNA. And RNA is a big challenge for any pulse sequence. Why? Because uh, we have this. Uh, uh, sugar signals that are overlapping with water. We have very large excitation bandwidth that's needed uh, by uh, because we have signals basically from 3 ppm to 15 ppm, and we have these fast exchanging aminos uh, from 10 to 15 ppm. So we need to take all of these things into consideration when designing uh, the right experiments. So uh, the the conclusion will be at the end that there is no perfect experiment. But first, I want to I want to try to convince you always to use water flipback pulse. So whatever experiment you have, I I, I, I suggest to add always uh, the, 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 the flipback pulse on water at the beginning. So you see here two spectra, both acquired with Watergate, but in red, we have this additional flip pulse trying to keep water on, on, on Z. So really it's the, the, the difference is just this pulse and you can see the effect that it has on the spectrum. So we have basically more than, uh, more than twice of the signal that we would detect without this uh, pulse, uh, just because we avoid this uh, pre-saturation or uh, of water during this uh, pulse tray uh, that that relays this effect to the to the biomolecule through exchangeable sites. And uh, here I compare now all three experiments: so the Watergate, excitation sculpting, and jump return. So they all try to to preserve water, but still you see there are differences. Uh, so iminos are, are the best when, when we use water gate or jump return, but you can see that in aromatic region here, jump return is, is not very good and water gate is pretty good and excitation sculpting is also not bad. But if you are interested in sugars, you have to use in most cases excitation sculpting and kind of uh, throw away part, part of the signals of, of, of iminos. Uh, so what I mentioned in the beginning is that optimization is often ne necessary. And for example, in, in Watergate uh, uh, 3919, it's very important to optimize this tau delay. And you can see it here. I see it many times uh, where st when students come and they run experiment and they, they detect uh, half of the spectrum and they complain that so something is bad. But it turns out they didn't optimize well this tau delay and they basically truncated or they didn't excite effectively a part of the spectrum. So you see here effect when, when tau was 80 microsecond and tau is 160 microseconds. So it, it requires a little bit of optimizations, but also from experience, you, you, you can know uh, what to apply. And it's magnetic field dependent because 
uh, yeah, it's not it's not the, one ppm is not the same on 500 megahertz or or, or 800 megahertz. So that needs to be taken in, into consideration as well. Uh, however, even though here I show that Watergate is kind of optimal experiment for uh, to detect iminos and and amides, uh, fast exchanging amides. Uh, there is actually the best experiment to if you are only interested in detecting immuno peaks of, of RNA or, or if you are detecting a fast exchanging uh, amide or uh, um, amino protons of in, in IDP. And that's uh, basically SOFA, selective spin echo. I mean, what's better than not pulsing at water at all? So water gets kind of doesn't excite water by pulsing on it, but so fast. Uh, uh, experiment tries not not to pulse on water as well by using these selective pulses to excite the region of of interest. And these are two uh, very optimized experiments. So uh, Watergate and Sofast regarding uh, the re the repetition rates, and you can see that Sofast has a su superior performance per uh, per unit time as well. Uh, and I want uh, th this is my my last slide. So I want to show another application. Uh, uh, in um, in in saccharides, so here we have like uh, sialic acid, the tetramer. It has uh, a lot of amide protons, but also sugar uh, OHs, and we can tune the pH where these sugar OHs uh, are, are still observable. And uh, I want you now to appreciate uh, uh, how important the choice of uh, of water suppression was when we were uh, trying to detect these OHs. For example, here I have. Uh, I, ha I have used the Watergate 3919 with with a flip pulse, but you can see that I I could preserve uh, or or achieve very good phase of OH is only uh, at high field, uh, whereas at at 500 megahertz, for example, um, those OHs were were severely broadened or or even uh, uh, within distorted ba baseline, and this is because uh, Watergate also. Uh, it didn't flip the, the the water sufficiently enough, and because of this fast exchange with uh, OH protons, I I perturb them. And then actually the uh, the the best choice, as we figured out afterwards, was to use excitation sculpting, even though OHs are 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 lower sensitivity compared to the to the water gate still. Uh, it provided much cleaner spectra to work with, so it was the me the method of choice, even though it was less sensitive uh, compared to the other methods. So to sum up, uh, uh, ideal water suppression technique should suppress water, provide wide excitation bandwidth without introducing any phase, and uh, ideally not perturb water. Uh, unfortunately, one cannot do it all, as um, as, and as as it's already mentioned. And we need to make compromises. I use these three very often, depending on what I on, on what, what I want to to observe. Uh, but yeah, we need to keep a, a, everything in mind and and try also different things if we have time. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I will be happy to answer questions as well. All right, Mihailo, thank you very much for that excellent talk. It's it's really incredible how how much thought goes into which which water suppression scheme to use, just based on you know the specific system that you're using, both 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 the chemical system and and as you made clear the the field strength you're working on. Yes, Re really great. Thank thank you very much. So, I think now we can open up the floor uh, to the audience and uh, have a discussion. Um, so if anybody has any questions for our speakers, um, especially Emmanuel, since he has a time commitment um, after this, um, let's let's do it. Yes, feel free to just unmute, unmute yourself and ask a question. No, no specific protocol for, for asking questions. OK, I'll lead off. It's Dave Russell. So really, three interesting talks. I enjoyed them all. I'll focus on Emmanuel, but it applies to sort of everyone. Uh, historically, I've done quite a bit of solvent suppression for small molecules and organics, so it's not water, and that makes it easier. Um, have you ever tried using out-of-band suppression? So, for instance, in an HSQC, if you just simply pick a, an F2 frequency that does not have the water peak in it or your solvent peaks in it, you get suppression from being out of band, you get suppression from not being attached to C13, and you can do preset out of band to suppress the water peak further. It makes everything easier because you don't have to be very good at any of them. Have you tried this? I do it all the time. Uh, no, and that's a good idea. And 
I would appreciate if you can send me an email with some more information about that. I, I can do that, but really all it amounts to is setting preset on your peak you want to suppress and then setting your proton window so that peak is not in your window and type go. That's it. Okay. 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 Yeah, thank you. I have one uh, direct message. Uh, what pulse sequence you're using for so fast? Uh, so uh, usually, I don't think there is a, a pulse sequence in in Broker user library. If I'm if I'm correct, so we coded our own experiment, but it's super simple based on uh, so fast experiment from 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 Shanda, uh, where they use it for. For, for for NH is for HMQC. So you can just uh, very easily make uh, 1D proton ver version out of it. I think there's a question for Dave. Dave, do you have a reference for the other band suppression scheme that you uh, talked about? Uh, I certainly have never seen it published, but it it's such a trivial thing i don't think it would be worthwhile publication just simply set the observed band so that water or your solvent that you're trying to get rid of is not in your observation band that's all no no uh shape pulses no band selective excitation you, you don't have to do anything no just just set the window where you want it so the digital filter is going to Thank do you. the job so the the digital filter will obviously suppress it somewhat uh, mm -hmm. If that's not enough, you can always turn preset on. It's easy enough just to turn the preset on anyway, and you don't have to optimize the preset because you're not looking for perfect suppression. You're just looking for a bit more. Yeah. It works really well. It's dead simple to do. There's, there's nothing to it. So, Dave, so so you would do this with, with hard pulses? Yeah. W Did wouldn't you? that excite the water too? It, it Yes. But since you're out of band, the digital filters are, are uh, removing it. It doesn't have, I'm thinking about HSQC. It's the place I've used it most often. It doesn't have a C13 attached, which suppresses it. And you do a little preset, you suppress it some more. Between them, it just, it's as if it's not there. And remember, a lot of times I'm doing this with organic chemistry reactions. So we're looking at solvents that are not as concentrated as water. In those cases, there is C13. There's often C13 attached, but it works just fine with water also. I mean, it's nothing fancy, guys. It's really nothing fancy. I, I published some of this, you know, back in my previous life. It was a blog post. You could probably still find that or just go set one up yourself. It's easy. Looks like there's another uh, question in the chat. Uh, Br Brendan, do you, do you want to turn your mic on and ask the question live? No. Okay. We'll Jenna, just read Jenna, it. Jenna, Jenna, you told me you told me to, to say it. Sorry, what's that? Oh, you asked me to to repeat the question. Oh no 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 no. So so somebody put a question in the chat. I was just giving them an opportunity to 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 voice it live. But it looks like they're uh, the person doesn't have a mic on their computer. So I'll I'll just read it. So Brendan Duggan asks, what is the best way to suppress multiple resonances? Is it worth combining preset with the gradient techniques? or just use gradients alone? Uh, since I mentioned wet, I could probably give my aspect here. So if you don't have exchangeable proton, let's say that you have, I don't know, DMSO with acetonitrile, no. Uh, wet is really nice in my opinion, but in the example I, I gave with the, ex which I think is because of the exchangeable protons, uh, if you combine, uh, wet, uh, which has gradients anyway, with noisy, it was pretty, pretty good. I mean, this doesn't mean that you cannot co do other types of combinations, but um, yeah, wet by itself or wet by noisy, it's a good thing. Just don't forget the decoupling, the C13 decoupling, because sometimes we tend to forget it and especially for a target analysis that you are going to do, a spectral comparison, this can cause you a small problem. May I ask one question? Yeah. Uh, 
I would uh, I understand how you can suppress like two solvents. Uh, so you can you can define your your nulls of excitation to to fall on the on the sol on two solvents but how can you do it for example with with three if you have three peaks that you want to get rid of is there any good way to to suppress three strong peaks i would say put the two on wet and the third noisy i had good luck with multi frequency pre saturation you can do it fairly okay. easily uh, with people. Well, I am identifying myself as a variant fan by saying P box, but it was done. Mm -hmm. Eric Scoop should, uh, made it very easy yeah. to do it with P box. Now you can do it with WaveMaker uh, in Brooker. Mm -hmm. So I had the good luck uh, doing uh, wine spectra. So you have water and ethanol, ethanol, two strong peaks. So, so you can. Yeah, so three three in total and multi-frequency pre-saturation works just fine uh, as long as, as Emmanuel said, don't forget carbon decoupling. Yeah, the carbon decoupling is a very good point for those satellite peaks. Yeah. I, so, I just want to... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please, please. So you, you do carbon decoupling all the way, all, all the time? Yes, you can do... Uh, so yes, you have to be very careful with the uh, power so I did a carbon decoupling, but it was basically a narrow band decoupling, only frequencies of the ethanol. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, to keep I wanted the to, parallel. I just wanted to add, I, I, I have a little bit of experience with, with multi-frequency suppression. Um, you, you could actually do it directly in top spin, like by going to the menu to the selective experiments. And it, it actually sets up um, either a nosy preset multi-frequency suppression for you, or a wet. And um, I remember the, the nosy preset actually worked quite well. It actually, once you define your regions, it, it, it makes the, I guess, the composite waveforms for you. And um, I think the ones that I actually had to use it in practice, it, it, it suppressed it pretty well. I, I also want to um, second what I believe Misha said about just using multiple presets. Um, I've done that before. You just open up a second channel and pop a preset mm -hmm. on there, and then you can just zap yeah, yeah, two yeah. things at once. Yeah. Oh, oh no, it, it's it's not the second channel. You do multi-frequency yeah, presaturation. Oh, oh, I see. So, so I've 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 actually done two channels before. Yeah. No, it's all done on, on the first channel. Um, uh, when you're, I, when you're using shape, sorry, when you're using shape pulses for multiple multiple frequency preset, you're much better off if you actually choose the window for each shape independently, depending on how you set it up and how which software you're using. Um, if you pick three spots, it may pick a band that's for instance, the width of the widest peak, and then you lose more baseline where your narrow peaks are. So be careful with that. You, it, depending on how it's set up in the software you're using, you can blast huge holes in your baseline if one of your peaks, the water peak is broad, and your ethanol peaks, as an example, are narrow. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dave. I, in, in, in my case, because it was always water, you know, ethanol, uh, CH2 and ethanol CH3 peaks, so the frequency was always the same. I optimized it pretty well before using it for routine samples. So yeah, some optimization is required. Yeah, I know that the Brooker, um, like automatic kind of routine, sometimes it works well, sometimes it does awful. So we've had, yeah, just recently tried to use that on something and it did not go well. So, I mean, actually it got us what we needed, but it did, I don't know, it wasn't, yeah, needs work. Yeah, so sometimes, so I, I've had a similar experience with one of the automated ones as well. And, you know, I, I, I confess I didn't spend too much time optimizing it and playing around with it. I saw it didn't work, so I went to the next one and it worked and, and I was on my way. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that Theodore Parella uh, published a paper in JMR using multiple site excitations copying uh, suppression. It was some 20 years ago, still available. Thank you. Thank you, Stuan. Of course. Uh, so it looks like somebody in the chat uh, has another question about composite pulses. So the question is, which composite pulses are typically used for pre-saturation? Um, if, if I could just comment. Uh, so my, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm uh, misunderstanding the question, but my understanding of using composite pulses with pre-saturation is 
first you have a typical preset, so just you know a long low power square, you know selective square pulse. Um, and then instead of a single 90, what you have is you have, let's say, four 90s. That, that's the composite pulse. And it, my understanding is that by, by doing it that way, you're actually capturing some of the, I believe the technical term is far away waters, the fringe waters, um, that usually contribute to the, to the wide base of the preset uh, residual that you see in your spectrum. So it actually tightens it up. So it, 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 can you clarify, is that what you meant by composite pulses or, or was it something else? This is for Shulan Jai. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing. Continuous wave is usually used for de decoupling. Okay. So okay, so I'll the I'll take that yes as a confirmation that I interpreted your question correctly. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, let's see. We have so Michael Respondek. Uh, do, do you want to ask your question live? Uh, more, more of a comment? No? Okay. So uh, Michael says, uh, I think Brooker has a webinar on their homepage. Look for something like world-class courses on how to set up multiple solvent suppression in top spin. Thank you. That's, that's a very good tip. I, I have a question. Um, this, the, I guess this is for, um, I guess this is both for, for I guess it's for all three panelists. What, what do you do when you need to be quantitative, but something as simple as a preset isn't an option? Personally, I run carbon. Okay. Especially, if you. You have, especially if you have an observed probe. It can be a, a, an option. That's a that's a really good workaround. Um, I I would imagine that might not work in the biomolecular case most of the time, right, uh, Mihailo? Yeah, because of you you mean if it's not labeled and yeah yeah definitely, but but it's possible. I mean you you can see signal average. Yeah, just scan for a couple of days. I think, I mean, for us, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe we're, it, it, it sort of depends. Um, but, you know, we can do direct standards. Um, and so if we know what we're looking for, I think that's always a good, really easy kind of workaround um, because it's going to be affected the same way. So, you know, if we decided we need to use excitation sculpting or something instead, but we're always, you know, looking at propylene glycol, right? It's going to be affected the same way every time. Um, assuming you're not in like, you know, this horribly distorted region, like I was showing for some of the propylene glycol signals before. Um, so I think that that's, you know, I don't know. That's a fortunate thing for us that we're not always doing broad spectrum um, work. Otherwise, I think it would be a lot of time spent trying to optimize some other pulse sequence and checking to make sure that it is quantitative. That's that's a really um, elegant workaround using um, external direct standards, so everything is kept apples to apples. That's yeah, that's really neat. I mean, I I have also to to add, but uh, I never failed to uh, to get bad uh, excitation scalping, so it always worked. And I spent minimum time uh, adjusting it. So I was really curious, you know, when I saw when when, when I saw your spectra that were a bit distorted because I've never seen something like that. And I, I worked also with small molecules as well. So that's why I, I I wanted maybe to discuss further how and why that happened and, and really why excitation sculpting is not qu quantitative. So I mean, I you can get it nicely. So I think that um, the fact that we also are incorporating a CPMG, uh -huh. right? I think that that has a lot of it. So you have this additional time to account for J modulation and things like that. So if you notice the slide where I was trying to optimize the excitation sculpting, I was purely changing CPMG parameters and it had a huge effect on what our um, peak shapes looked like. So 
I don't know, maybe there is room to, again, like, you know, I don't know, add something else in to try and further optimize how that yeah. works. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I would do uh, I, I would also know that uh, the definition of what is quantitative and what is not quantitative can vary significantly depending on application. So for some people, one proton versus two protons is quantitative enough. And for other people, 0.1% is too much of an error. True, that's definitely true. Yeah. yeah, if you're working with like certified reference standard um, certification, yeah. Point one might be too big, but but I think I think this discussion about excitation sculpting about about the about the distortions it, it, it's a nice segue into the the role of scalar couplings. So so Mihailo, when when I used to use excitation sculpting, I, I would always see distortions, not always very severe, um, but a lot of times even though the peaks looked like they were in phase, um, when, when you really zoom in, you see that you know between peaks. The, the valleys would actually sometimes dip below the baseline and the peaks would, you, you, you can see that they're, they're not exactly Lorentzian anymore. This is, this is you know, it's clearly a, a homonuclear scalar coupling evolution, you know, re rearing its ugly head. Um, I, I know that there has been quite a few papers published um, over the last decade, uh, particularly coming out of the, the Manchester uh, methodology group of, of Gareth Morris, where they're sticking perfect echoes into various um, water suppression uh, sequences. I also know that, that Teo Perella has an excellent paper from MRC from a couple of years ago called uh, Towards Perfect NMR, where he talks about how almost any NMR building block can be quote unquote perfected by sticking a, per, a perfect echo in there. And there is a whole section that he dedicates to, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, yeah, perfect yeah. water suppression. So so for, for anyone not familiar with perfect echoes, a perfect echo is when you have two spin echoes with a 90 degree pulse in the middle. And basically what that 90 degree pulse does is it takes any antiphase components that evolve and it actually swaps them. And then you go into the second spin echo. And for uh, doublets for so for a two spin two for two scalar coupled spin one halves um, under ideal circumstances the refocusing from the scalar coupling evolution is actually perfect. Uh, my understanding from the literature is that there's a little bit of relaxation loss for um, non doublets, but the refocusing in general is, is really good as well. And so I, uh, there, there's there's a ton of literature um, on this with. with, with with respect to water suppression. So I guess my, my question is, does, does anybody have any experience using uh, water suppression schemes that, that incorporate perfect echoes? And you know, if, if anybody does, you know, what, what, what is your experience? Is this something you would recommend? Um, you, you know, these, these are double spin echoes. So if relaxation is a factor that that would be the price to pay. Um, on the other hand, if you, uh, if you suppress homonuclear scalar coupling evolution, you 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 then have the ability to be more selective um, because you can you you can make your shape pulses longer um, with, without the antiphase buildup. Uh, so we put it in, in, in HSQC to suppress uh, homonuclear J coupling evolution, but uh, I never managed to to keep water you know good and then doing what it's supposed to do. So, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Full disclaimer, my preset spectra that I showed today are perfect echo CPMG preset. Um, but that's actually something you set up, Gennady, before that, you that, left well, 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 Yes, but that was a perfect echo CPMG, not, not, right. not the yeah, actual that's water suppression. Yeah, we were using, right, so. Um, it's incorporated there. I don't, I was, throughout this whole, this exercise, I was thinking, you know, I wonder if that would help, you know, as far as incorporating the excitation sculpting in, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't have any, yeah. Okay. Well, if, if anyone is interested, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Manchester NMR group um, actually has some of these pulse sequences available to download. I, I think some of them are in variant format, but I know there's at least one um, in Brooker format. So it would, it would be interesting to see, um, to hear you, you user feedback, you know, in, 
you know, from, from the real world. I think somebody just sent a publication in the chat. I'm assuming that's what it was in reference to. I see it's a Royal Society of Chemistry, so I can imagine where this is going. Oh, interesting. I was not aware of this paper. Reliable high quality suppression of NMR signals arising from water and mac macromolecules application to biofluid analysis. Uh, yep, I'm seeing some perfect, yep, I'm seeing some perfect echoes in there. And I'm seeing the robust five perfect echo suppression. Yeah, so that's, so the robust five, so this is figure one uh, panel C, it's essentially a W5 water gate. Um, uh, with an excitation sculpting with a, in a perfect echo format. So you basically have um, two gradients with a W5 element in the middle, then you have the 90 for the perfect echo, followed by uh, two more gradients with a W5 between that. So all of your solute magnetization um, is just gonna go through there and it just thinks it's a perfect echo, all the homonuclear scalar coupling, yeah, it's gonna get refocused. Um, and then the water, yeah, it's, it's gonna get suppressed. Lose, probably you lose a lot of signal, right, towards the end. What's that now? Uh, you probably lose a lot of signal towards the end of the of the block. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have two of these elements, so so when relaxation is at a premium, you know, might might not be the best choice. Um, but I think this this goes back to the central theme that there's no such thing as a you know a perfect water suppression scheme, and there's there's always a price to pay, and it really has to do with you know your your specific um, application and needs. Which, which I really think is the central theme of this whole entire session. There's, there's no magic bullet. Let's see, are there, are there any other questions or topics of discussion from the audience? Uh, hi, good day. Hi, Misha. This is Alex saying. Alex Can you hear me? Yes. I, I have a question to Mikhailo, maybe uh, as a most uh, showing applications for the biomolecules. Uh, we found here that uh, uh, using the diffusion filter is actually helps to recover all, almost all signal under the water uh, without any presaturation or excitation sculpting. Seems like a very powerful uh, experiment to run with, of course, some losses of the intensities, but even for the moderate size of peptides, it's actually working pretty well. I wonder if it uh, has been considered for the okay. biomolecules. Yeah, I, I use diffusion pretty often. I kind of classified it uh, within this uh, def, uh, defacing of the water organization using a, a field gradient pulses. But yeah, in theory, it's not that, but yeah, it's based on that. Uh, I use it in, in my opinion, for, for biomolecules, you lose too much uh, of the signal of protein or, or RNA if you want to kill the water that way. I mean, it's super effective. You get very clean. And probably if you want to detect very uh, like uh, CL, uh, H alphas or, or the sugar resonances, that's the way to go uh, because you, you just kill water that's fastly diffusing. Uh, but I don't use it uh, routinely. I mean, I do a lot of diffusion measurements, but not to suppress water, but rather, yeah. Uh, even I, I try to combine, you know, if, if you want to integrate diffusion measurements, you want you want to, to keep the baseline as, as good as possible. So even combine diffusion with the water gate to achieve, you know, perfect water suppression. Any other questions or comments? I guess if there are no more other questions, I'll speak up here and and so I'll ask once more if there are any other questions. So I guess if there aren't any, uh, this has been a great set of talks and, and so practical <laughs> as in your title. And uh, so uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today. And John, I guess, has, has had to disappear. So I will thank everyone for John as well. And so with that, I'll close our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.